Thank you, Dr. Tanner, President Samuelson. Uh, thank you to all of my academic colleagues and friends. Uh, thank you to all of you for taking time this morning to come hear my remarks. It's an honor for me to be here at Brigham Young, and it's a delight for me to be here in beautiful Provo. Uh, the last time I was here was in the fall of 2007, and I have happy memories of my last visit, and I have uh, great anticipation of my next. I'm always delighted to be here, and I can see why uh, statistics show that Utahns are some of the happiest people in the United States. It's quite clear just by looking around why that would be so. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about something that you've probably given a lot of thought to, charity. But I want to talk about it in a way that maybe you haven't thought about it, about how you can use it in your lives and use it in the lives of others. I want to talk to you about how charity can and should prominently figure in the lives of Christian people, um, but in a way that maybe hasn't quite occurred to you before. Uh, and I want to start with a quote from the famous industrialist John D. Rockefeller from 1905. Rockefeller was famously quoted in that year as saying, God gave me my money. Now, that's sort of troubling to Christian people like us. God gave him his money. And it, it, it's frequently used as evidence that, that John D. Rockefeller was a bad man, that he believed that he deserved to be rich when other people were poor. But that's actually not what he meant. Here's the full quote. God gave me my money. I believe the power to make money is a gift from God to be developed and used to the best of our ability for the good of mankind. What he meant was this. He believed that he made money because he was charged with helping others with his money. And he honestly believed, he wrote at other times, that if he stopped giving his money and giving it in the right way, that God would take his money away. Now, that still might trouble you theologically, that God would intervene in the, finance, in the direct finances of John D. Rockefeller, but you have to admit it doesn't sound so weird at that point. Now, John D. Rockefeller believed that he was rich because he gave so much, and throughout his life, before he was a rich man, he gave a lot. He was a charitable person. A lot of entrepreneurs believe that one of the reasons that they're rich is because they give. Entrepreneurs in this country are some of the most charitable citizens. And I've always heard this because for years I taught in a department of entrepreneurship. So I got to know the modern John D. Rockefellers who thought that they were rich partly because they gave. But you know, I never believed it. I never believed a word of it because I was trained as an economist. A lot of you have taken classes in economics. And when you walk into your first class in economics, here's what the professor doesn't say. You want to get rich? Give all your money away. That's not the advice. It doesn't make sense. No, no, no. You have to have money first, and then you can give it away. That's what economists like me thought, think. So I set out to test John D. Rockefeller's view that he was rich because he gave and all the other entrepreneurs that I talked to. And my goal was this. Next time I heard somebody say it, I was going to say, no, 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 no. I have the data. The data say, no, you have to have it before you can give it away. Well, I'm going to tell you what I found. And in a nutshell, what I found was that Rockefeller was right, and I was wrong. And I'm going to show you the evidence that shows you how wrong I was and how you can use this information in your life and how I'm using it in mine. But first, a little background, a little background on charitable giving in America. Americans give. Americans give a lot. In 2006, uh, American citizens privately gave about $300 billion away to charity. Uh, now, $300 billion, that's, is that a lot? Is that a little? Who even knows these days? I mean, the, the president with a stroke of a pen could give away three times that to people who've not paid their mortgages, for all we know. It's a crazy time out there. But to put it into perspective, $300 billion is more than the entire national income of Sweden. We give away to charity more than the Swedes make in their whole country in income. That's a lot of money. Americans, 75% uh, of Americans' family, families give every year. 50% volunteer their time. And many Americans give in myriad other ways that are not captured in data. Now, at one point, when I was teaching 
about this subject, I decided to figure out who in America is the most charitable, and I compared states. And you're not going to be very surprised at what I found. The most charitable state in the United States, of course, is Utah, where people uh, give approximately twice as much as the second leading state in charitable giving. So congratulations to you. Um, I recommend that you be proud, but that's not right. You should be pleased about that. <laughs> and keep it up. Now, given this, so, you know, one often asks, how do Americans compare in charitable giving with people around the world? And there's a perception out there, if you listen to politicians, that we're stingy. So Jimmy Carter, the former president of the United States, said in a recent, relatively recent speech, you know the problem with Americans, they just don't care about the less fortunate of the world. Well, the data say that President Carter is wrong. If we look at how Americans give per capita compared to citizens in other countries of the world, we will find that the average American citizen gives away three and a half times as much money each year as the average French citizen, seven times as much as the average German, 14 times as much as the average Italian. Now, as an economist, I want to know whether or not that's because we're richer. So when you correct for income differences and tax differences and all the things that, that make the United States a different country, you find that the gap doesn't close. This is an authentic difference in culture. Once again, something I do believe we can be quite pleased with. The question then is, why does it matter? And which is pushing and which is pulling? Is the fact that we're, generally speaking, a richer country the reason that we give so much, as I had always thought? Or is it true what John D. Rockefeller would have said, that we give so much and guess what? That's one of the secrets to our success. That's what I set out to show. I set out to show that Rockefeller was wrong, that you have to have the money before you give it away, that we all need to go to work, that we need tax policy that puts plenty of money in our pockets and then we'll help each other. That's what I intended to show. And the way that I set out to show that is by gathering data on 30,000 American families from all over the country. Actually, colleagues at Harvard University collected the data in the year 2000. From coast to coast, 41 communities, big and small towns, north and south. Salt Lake City was one of the, was one of the communities we looked at, Washington, D.C. Uh, Seattle, Washington, my hometown, lots of places were in there. 30,000 families were asked questions about how much they gave, what they gave to, how much money they made about their education and their family life and everything in between. It was the most comprehensive look at people's service behavior and their charitable giving that we've ever had before. And I really eagerly anticipated these data because I was going to show what I'd always thought. This was going to give me a statistical a way to show that you have to have the money first. So I charted it up, did all the statistical analysis. It took me months in my darkened office and with my computer waiting for my conclusion, and I got the conclusion. The conclusion was, sure enough, when people get richer, they tend to give more money away. But I also found the reverse, that when people give more money away, they tend to prosper. Specifically, here's what I found. If you have two families that are exactly identical, in other words, same religion, same race, same number of kids, they live in the same town, same level of education, everything's the same, except that one family gives $100 more to charity than the second family. The giving family will earn, on average, $375 more in income, and that's statistically attributable to the gift. Now, when I got this, I was perplexed. I was really confused because it didn't go with my theory. This is what, in psychology, we call cognitive dissonance where I have two competing ideas and they're in conflict with each other. On the one hand, I had the theory that I had always worked under. On the other hand, I had data that completely contradicted the theory. So I did what college professors always do in this case, which is I got rid of the data. <laughs> and I said, that can't be right. I've obviously messed something up. I got new software. I looked for new data, I recrunched the numbers, I kept coming up with the same thing. I ran the numbers again and I looked at volunteering, same thing. People volunteer, they do better in life. I did the same thing with blood contributions, blood donations, think about that, giving blood. You're not gonna get richer if you give blood, are you? 
Yeah, you are. <laughs> you are. So it can't be right, so I ignored it. I didn't publish it, didn't publish it at all. And I was kind of rolling it around in my head for a long time. And I thought, you know, I've got a better way to test this. I'm going to look at the whole United States. I'm going to see how charitable giving changes over a 50-year period and compare it to what happens with income. And then I can see which is pushing statistically and which is pulling. So here's how I got the data that looked like this. And I won't bother you with too many graphs like this. But in this graph, what you see is the top line is what's happened to income, inflation adjusted. This is real purchasing power to the average family between 1954 and 2004. And what you see is a 150% increase in real purchasing power. This is great news. This is actually an amazing thing worldwide. You simply don't see growth like this in real purchasing power to already rich countries. It's, a, it's an incredible achievement that the United States has undertaken. This is a testament to prosperity that comes from productivity and hard work and dedication. This is a good thing. The bottom line is the changes in charitable giving. What you find there is that the charitable giving has also increased over the same period per family on average by 190%. And this is an even better story because what this says is that we're getting more prosperous in this country, but we're getting even more generous over time. I'm pleased with this result. It, it, it tells me that what Jimmy Carter said about this country is not right once again. We're not a stingy country. Could we be more generous? Of course. But it's not true that at least we're getting stingier. Okay, but the real question for me is which is pushing and which is pulling? Is income driving up donations, or is donations driving up income, or, or what? And the answer, once again, is both. You find that when our country gets richer, people do give more away. But as we give more away, that translates into better economic growth for this country. Statistically, what we find is this. If we were to increase our private charitable donations by just, two, by just 1%, which is about $2 billion a year. $2 billion a year from people like you and me writing checks to our favorite causes, our churches, our favorite charities. If we just did that, that would translate into GDP of about 39 billion new dollars. That's a great multiplier. Now, $39 billion by today's stakes is nothing. I mean, they, the president pulls $39 billion from behind the cushions of the couch at the White House. It's laundry money. It's, not, it's three months in Iraq. It's 5% of the stimulus package. It's, it's nothing. But it's a great multiplier. If I can take your $2 billion in charity and turn it into $39 billion, then, then suddenly charitable giving is not just a great investment for you. It's a patriotic act for our country, because it translates into jobs and growth and opportunity and tax revenues and all the stuff that we really like. If that's true, if I'm getting this crazy result and it keeps coming back with the same thing over and over and over, Rockefeller was right. Still refused to believe it. So I went to a colleague, finally, in desperation, who specializes in the psychology of charitable giving. And I said, I, I'm getting this result that I can't understand. And it doesn't make sense. It's like the hand of God or something on the economy. And, and I can't believe it's true. And the first thing he said is, why don't you believe it's true? You're a Christian, aren't you? And I said, yeah, but I'm a social scientist. We're not supposed to think those things. I need a more earthbound explanation. And he said, well, I'll give you one. We've known this for 30 years in the psychology profession. I said, well, tell me, tell me. I, we don't, uh, he says, we just haven't been talking about money. You economists, you worry about money all the time, and money's boring. We're, we worry about something that people really care about, the currency by which we really spend our days, and that's happiness. And we've known for 30 years that people who give get happier as a result. Can you use that? And I said, oh, yeah, because I know from teaching at a business school that the best way to run a successful business is to hire happy people. That's really where the action is. Some of you know that too. You want to have a productive business? You want to be a productive person? Work on your happiness. Happy people show up for work more. They work longer hours. They work more joyfully. They're happier with every aspect of their productive lives. Happiness is the secret to success. And now, if that's true, I've got the answer. Charity brings happiness, happiness brings success, and now I'm on to something. It turns out 
that the data on happiness and charitable giving are beyond dispute. People who give to charity are 43% more likely than people who don't to say they're very happy people. People who give blood are twice as likely to say they're very happy people as people who don't give blood. People who volunteer are happier. The list goes on. You simply can't find any kind of service and that won't make you happier. Laboratory experiments using human subjects find that when people are asked to give to other people, they elevate their mood. Furthermore, if you increase your level of charitable giving, you can permanently your level of what psychologists call positive affect, which is to say being in a good mood. You can be a happier person that way. It's the secret, basically. The, the real question is not whether that's true. The question is why that's true. And there's a very interesting set of studies that tell us why it is that giving will make you into a happy person. The first has to do with how it changes your brain. I'm going to explain that in a minute. The second is what it does to how other people treat you. So let me explain. The first is that the wiring of our brains is conducive to charitable giving. And it works something like this. Uh, in, in the late 1980s, in 1988, there was a famous study of charitable giving uh, that looked at how people reacted with respect to the endorphins that they experienced. Now, endorphins are neurochemicals that make you feel a, a, a sort of euphoria. So if you like to run marathons, one of the, the good things about it is you feel really good. You feel sort of high, in a way. And psychologists came forth with a study that showed that when people volunteer to help other people, they get what they call the helper's high. They actually get a mild sense of euphoria. Now, I think that's an interesting study, but it doesn't help me explain prosperity. The helper's high doesn't get me there. And the reason is this. Uh, when I was in high school, I went to school with a lot of kids who specialized in getting high. And it turns out that that was not a secret to success. Um, now that I'm 44 years old and I keep in touch with a couple of people from high school, I can assure you that that was not the pathway to great prosperity that they took. So it's interesting that you get this helper's high, but it doesn't help us explain this, all this worldly prosperity that I keep finding in my data. Later studies of the brain came up with a more compelling explanation. Later studies showed that when people give, it lowers their levels of stress. This is really important to understand in prosperity because one thing that we know is people who do their jobs with less stress tend to be more productive and more successful than those who perform it with more stress. You will find throughout your lives, you, if you can find ways to relax, you will profit from this level of relaxation. And studies have shown that charitable giving will objectively lower the stress levels that people feel in their everyday lives. There's one famous study from the Duke Medical School in 1996. It's a study that I love because it's so strange. It was senior citizens who were being asked in an experiment to give massages to infants, to little babies, which is a funny thing. It's, it just goes to show you that in the university, you can get tenure for doing anything. <laughs> and these senior citizens, half of them gave massages to infants and the other half didn't, and they monitored the stress hormones in their brains to see what happens. Now, there are three stress hormones. For your information, this is the kind of thing that when you're like me, you write books for a living, uh, you find out about what are the three stress hormones. They're called cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. When somebody cuts you off in traffic or insults you or you get a, 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 a D on an exam or something like that, those chemicals are lighting up your brain like your Christmas tree, and you're unhappy as a result because you're stressed out. What you want to do is to go through life with less cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine in your day-to-day -day life. And what they found in the study of the senior citizens is that those who gave the massages to the babies cut their stress hormones in half. Big finding. The, what the, their interpretation was that this is great advice for people who want to be more effective. And this tells us something about why people who give a lot as part of their regular lifestyles are going to be more successful. The second set of studies has not to do with your brain when you give, but other people's brains when you give. A study from the University of Kent in southern England was dedicated to figuring out how people see others who are givers. 
And there's a study called, a, it was a, a, uh, an experiment called a cooperation game in which people were gathered in a large room and they were given a little bit of money and asked to contribute to a common fund. Then the researchers looked in the common fund and they doubled it and passed it out equally among the participants. Now if you think about that game, the best thing for everybody to do is to put in all of their money and have it doubled. But if you're crafty, what you want to do is hold back all your money when everybody else puts in theirs, don't cooperate, and that way you get a, your own money and a chunk of everybody else's. That's the idea. Now they've been, they've been doing this kind of study for years. What made it interesting in the study from the University of Kent was this. There was a second phase in which people in the game who had witnessed each other cooperating and giving to each other were asked to break up into teams and elect leaders. What they found was that in 82% of the cases, the leaders elected were the biggest givers from the first phase. Their conclusion, a conclusion that, should, that which has been verified in subsequent experiments, is that when people see strangers giving charitably, they recognize a leadership quality in those strangers. If people witness you as a giver, they will see a leader. Servant leadership is no joke, and it's a secret to success. Whether you're looking for success or not, when people see you giving and cooperating, serving others, they will see in you a leader or a future leader, and that cannot help but to help you. There are many other studies that show that givers have better health, that givers are better citizens. It goes on and on. The bottom line is this. People who are healthier, happier, and richer in this country, probably around the world, are givers. We gives us stronger communities. Indeed, it gives us a more prosperous nation. So the question for me now is, who gives the most? Who's getting all this giving, get all this benefit? It's a wonderful benefit for themselves and for their communities when they give. Well, I told you before, people from Utah, but that doesn't get me far enough because it's not just that if you move across the border from Idaho, they're suddenly going to start coughing up to charity. It's not going to do it. There's something else going on, and you know what it is. It's practicing faith. This is the number one characteristic that explains charitable giving in this country is practicing one's faith. People who practice their faith regularly, which is to say they attend worship services every week, 91% give to charity each year. People who don't attend every week, 66% do. Now, this translates into millions and millions of people who are healthier, happier, and more prosperous than their neighbors, and it charts back to a lot of their religious experiences. Two, two ways to explain this now. Two explanations for this God and giving link. Explanation number one, you're better people. That's not a very Christian explanation. <laughs> explanation number two is that you've been given a special gift, the gift of giving. Now, I'm going to ask you to take a pretty sophisticated understanding here of charitable giving. Because as Christian people, we are taught that giving is important to help others. I'm telling you, the data say giving helps you, so if you want to help others, don't just give to them. Think about what you can do today to help somebody else to give. The main beneficiary of a charitable gift is the giver, him or herself. Let me summarize that. What, does, what do the data tell me as a Christian man? The answer is, I am the big beneficiary of my own giving. That people like me who take my faith seriously uh, are the beneficiaries because we tend to give a lot. We've been taught to do what is right and we're reaping the reward. So how can we, given this fact, reinterpret the scriptures about charitable giving? How can we take it to the next level? Consider this. Mosiah 4.21, and now if God who has created you on whom you are dependent for your lives and for all that ye have and are, doth grant unto you whatsoever ye ask that is right in faith, believing that ye shall receive, oh, then how ye ought to impart of the substance that ye have one to another. The traditional interpretation of this passage, which is similar to the passage in any sacred text, is basically, give more to other people. You have so much, give more. Take it to the next level. Take it to the source of the prosperity. You have been given the gift of giving. Give the gift of giving. 
how are you going to do that? How are you going to help somebody to give more today? There are a lot of ways to do it. Let me tell you how you've done it for me. Let me tell you, and you don't even know this, but let me tell you a little story, a quick story. I want to tell you a story about a briefcase. I know it's a weird subject for a story, but it's actually a magic briefcase. It's my magic Brigham Young University briefcase. I visited here in the fall of 2007 for the first time. I'd never been here before. And uh, my friend Gary Cornea, who's, the, who's the, the dean of the business school, he gave me a beautiful briefcase that said Brigham Young University on it. And I took it home and I put it away because I already had a briefcase. Uh, and I didn't think about it. But about a month later, my briefcase broke. Uh, and I was complaining to my wife. And I said, it's, it, the handle's broken. It's very inconvenient. She said, well, what about that BYU briefcase you brought home? Why don't you carry that? I said, oh, uh, okay. That's a good idea. So I took all my stuff and I put it in the BYU briefcase and I started carrying it around. Um, now, I, I, at the time, I had a, I, uh, my research assistant at Syracuse University. His name is Nick Bailey. He's here. He actually he works at BYU now. He noticed. He says, "You're carrying a BYU briefcase." So I said, "Yeah, it's great. It's an Italian briefcase. It's it's it's, it's very nice. It's nicely done." Um, and one of the things that I noticed, it was funny, is that when I was out in public, because I travel a lot, that the first thing that people you don't know when you're carrying a briefcase, it says something on it. They'll read the briefcase and they'll look at you. And and I and, and it occurred to me, people were saying. He's a Mormon guy. And that's actually sort of false religious advertising because I'm a Roman Catholic. Now, I take my faith really seriously, but no matter how seriously I take my faith, technically that still doesn't make me into a Mormon. So I, I, I was walking around saying basically I'm a Mormon. And, and, and the, the funny thing is it was changing my personality. And the reason it was changing my personality is because I noticed when I was mortified by the idea that somebody would say, you know, I was in the airport and I saw this Mormon guy and he was being a real jerk. I didn't want, I, would, I, I wanted to live up to your reputation. <laughs> it was making me into a better person. It was a magic briefcase. <laughs> And, and so it might be occurring to you, what's the implication of this story? Well, it might, it, obviously, I'm trying to get a new briefcase right now. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, it may be, you know, the greatest kind of evangelization that the LDS church can undertake is to buy 300 million briefcases and give them out to all, all Americans or something like that. But my big point here is that it was making my life better. I was happier. Things were going really well for me as I was carrying that briefcase. And the reason is because the service for which you've become justifiably famous was infecting my life. It was making me better. And that making me better was not just helping somebody that I would help at an airport, it was helping me. And I thank you for that. So how else, besides accidentally buying somebody a briefcase, can you find a way to help other people to give more today. Let's start with some myths about charitable giving. Myth number one, giving makes us poorer. You hear this all the time. This is what, you're, what the economist like me thinks. It's wrong. It's wrong. You have to fight it. And there are arguments that are not just the hand of God, at least not directly the hand of God, maybe the hand of God through our neurochemistry, have to do with the structure of our brains, but good explanations for why this is not true. Myth number two is that people are naturally selfish. I hear this constantly. They're not going to give. People are just selfish. People are selfish, it's true, but they're not naturally selfish. People are unnaturally selfish. When we are our best selves, when we are in equilibrium, when we are where we're supposed to be cognitively, neurochemically, spiritually, we're giving people. Myth number three is that giving's a luxury. It's not. It's a necessity. It's the first 10%, not the last 10%. And the reason is because if we want to be better, we have to give. Myth number four, this is not a public policy lecture, but I'm a public policy professional, so I'm going to make one public policy point here today. You will hear in the coming days and weeks and months that if our country were doing what it should be doing for people in need, then that we wouldn't need private giving that the government would be taking care of people who need it, that we would not need you to step in to provide needs. I am here to tell you today, having looked at the data, that the day the government takes over for you and your private charity is the day we get poorer, 
unhappier and unhealthier. The process starts right now, the day the government crowds us out. We must demand to take our place as givers and to support our communities of need and people who need the services that we can provide. How else can we get it? Well, teaching. Um, we're teachers. I'm a teacher. You're a teacher. We're leaders in our communities. Everything that we do demonstrates what we believe. People mimic those who are successful and those who are happy, people who are well-adjusted. You've heard many times uh, throughout your training uh, in church and in school that you're never really alone. Somebody's always watching you. You're always creating an example, and as such, you're a teacher. What will you do today that people will see to make sure that it's clear that you're a charitable giver and they will emulate you? How can we bring our creativity to bear more in our families, in our churches? How can we create a curriculum where giving is a core competency? We're very good at teaching reading and writing. Well, we're not that good at that either. But uh, in theory, we're pretty good at teaching reading and writing. We're not very good. We don't take teaching giving seriously, yet this is a core competency for successful citizenship and happy life. We need to be better about teaching this. And so what I charge you with today is what I charge myself with, is more creative solutions to see how we can work these concepts more into our everyday life. You can tell this has changed my life a lot. I hope you can tell that, and it really has. When I was working on this research four years ago, uh, I came home with a chapter from a book, of a book that showed these data analysis, and, and, and my wife read it. She reads everything I write. She tells me pretty honestly when it's not so good. And, but she read this, and she said, I think this is really something. I think we can use this. I said, yeah, we should give more. We should write bigger checks. We should take this seriously. She said, no, 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 no. I think we should do something bigger. She said, I think we should adopt a baby. All right? And I, sh and I said, sweetheart, it's only a book. <laughs> but I had no argument. We had to do it. And we did it. We did it. It was the best thing we ever did. That changed our life even more. I guarantee you, your money cheerfully refunded. I can't guarantee that. But I promise you that this stuff really works. It works for reasons if you want because of God in heaven, or it works if you want for reasons of your neurochemistry, but it really works. And I leave you with that. And one more thought. Um, as an American citizen, as a person with great delight to be here at BYU, but living in this great country, uh, one of the things that I've learned as a result of my research is that I'm a happy, prosperous person, not just because of the economic situation that not so great today, but generally is pretty good in this country. It's because I live in a country of people who serve. It's because you give to your churches and the causes that you care about here in Utah, even though I live in Washington, D.C., that gives me a richer, happier, and healthier country. So for all that you do between your student life and your giving and your missions and everything else that characterizes your life of service, which helps me so much, my last word to you is thank you.